Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. Hello, you must be Ben. I am. I'm Jennifer. Nice to meet you, Jennifer. My name is Jennifer, and I started the podcast Fading Memories, well, technically more than a year ago. My first anniversary is coming up, and it's a Alzheimer's caregivers support podcast because... We all need as much support as we can get if we're caring for a loved one with memory loss. And I found that there weren't a lot of podcasts out there that did that. Actually, there was really, there was only one. So I jumped in the fray and started my own. Awesome. That's absolutely a critical, important piece. So I, so the reason I know that is because I teach. My name is Ben Brooks. Just for your introductions, I, I, I do... A, we do a podcast on dogs in the news, Michelle and I do, and then I'm also a biochemistry professor, and so I teach large classes of biochemistry people, and this is a top, Alzheimer's is a very, very common topic for us in class, and I commonly ask the students, what, how does Alzheimer's impact them, and it's, it is probably along with cancer and heart disease and diabetes, it is right up there on the top. I, I probably should put together a list, but Alzheimer's care impacts, and we do a little project, and Alzheimer's is almost always a top topic among students. And, you know, this is our young people, so it affects, it's going all the way down and impacting. Yeah, I recently did an interview with millennial caregivers, which my um, daughter's 27, so she's, I guess, on the younger end of the millennial generation. In just talking to the other gal who was slightly older, I think she was like 31 or 32, it just, it just make, broke my heart. And she's caring for her grandmother. Grandmother's still living independently, but it's like, I ended up having to help. My, my dad passed away out right after my 50th birthday. Oh. And so obviously my sister and I then became fully responsible for our mom and that was when I realized that she was a lot worse off than I was aware of. And I knew she was bad. So that was kind of not a fun revelation. But, and I wasn't ready at 50 to give up working. And, you know, the bank would prefer I keep working to pay the mortgage and all those details. <laughs> and, you know, my daughter had just moved out a month before my dad died. I was like, I'm not, yeah, I'm not ready to to be a caregiver to somebody 24-7 for the next 10 or 15 years or yeah, about 10 or 15 years. She's only 76 and she's physically very healthy. So she could live quite a long time. And I thought, you know, if I was 70, it might be a different story, but not at yeah, 50. Absolutely. Um, but you don't have to put together your own list of where Alzheimer's impacts um, people. Go to the Alzheimer's Association's website. It's alz.org and they have, uh, like an infographic. Alzheimer's oh, yeah. is the fifth leading cause of death nationwide. And here in California, it is the third leading cause of death. Yay for being the most populous state in the union. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle, you should jump in right now and introduce yourself. Yes. Okay. Hi, my name is Michelle Whalen, and uh, I've been working with Ben for how long, Ben? Like three years now. Yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know how um, I would survive without you, so... <laughs> Well, thanks. Um, I'm a dog dog owner and lover. And uh, regarding Alzheimer's, I'm actually, uh, I have a, we call him my adopted grandfather, and he has early onset Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm hearing you, Jennifer. I, we, I understand yeah, how, my... how difficult and frustrating it is and how lost you feel without any kind of support. Yeah, fortunately, I went to if you've ever experienced hospice, I went to one of their support groups, their grief, grief support group after my dad passed away. And it was like, this is good for that part of my life. But the bigger part is the daily grief of, you know, my mom is not my mom anymore. She has no idea who I am. She has no idea my dad died. And that's way harder to deal with. It's like, I can accept that he's gone. There's occasional times when, you know, I get a little 
depressed, not depressed, but a little sad about it, things that he's missing. Like my daughter, who is not a so social person, just started actually planning her wedding. It's like, oh my God, I didn't think that was ever going to happen. <laughs> and, you know, but then I also think, I just told my husband, I'm like, we're going to have to wait and see if we bring my mom. Because my mom has no clue who her oldest grandchild is. And they were super close. So that kind of daily sadness led me to Google Alzheimer's support groups. And that's how I found the one through the Alzheimer's Association. And that's been fantastic. I've been in that one for a little over a year, almost a year and a half. And then I get to talk to all kinds of fantastic people through the podcast. And I've learned so much. It's like if the people who listen to my podcast have learned and gotten as much help as I have, and I've been on this journey a long time with my mom, then I'm doing something right. So hopefully they're learning along the way too. <laughs> well, so we would like to kind of, the reason we're kind of doing this is for two reasons. First off, we think that there's really good opportunities for us to discuss how dogs can help in Alzheimer's care in, in a couple different capacities. And um, if you want to discuss Alzheimer's at a biochemistry level, like I'll geek out on you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell a lot of my guests that if I was like half my age and had twice as much sense for science, I'm an artist, obviously I'm a photographer and now I do podcasting, that's an art form too. I like science, but I don't understand a lot of it. If that was different, I would totally go into brain research because I just find it so fascinating. But yeah, it, it's not some, it's not something I regularly do. Uh, I so I got my PhD in prions, and if if you're familiar with prion diseases, I suspect that a large number of the Alzheimer's cases are actually prion diseases, creutzfeldt jakob disease, which is um, another protein misfolding disease, and so the prion protein will also forms. Um, plaques and aggregates and does very similar things. So, and a lot of times if you don't do an autopsy, you're not going to notice the difference between the two. The, the pathologies are very, very similar. And so anyway, I, the, and the proteins are very similar in that the structures are very similar. They form when they become misfold, they're a normal protein, they're associated with memory. And so anyway, that's what I did my PhD in. And so I uh, and I teach biochemistry. And so when we talk about Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's is a classic biochemistry story. There is so much fundamental biochemistry in it, and there's still so much we don't know. So much. Oh, that's true. Well, you, we will have, you and I will have to do an episode on that, but you're going to absolutely way dumb it down for some of us though. Cause you're like almost losing me a little bit there already. <laughs> <laughs> And that's fine. I, I, I have a tendency to do that. But I, I do find the, the, the cool part is we are making progress and in the in the area. In fact, you know, um, a lot of a lot of people think that the Alzheimer's proteins are actually and this is why you, I don't know if you saw the article about gingivitis. Yes. Not recently. So there's a lot of people, a lot of good evidence that suggests that both um, the amyloid pro, uh, amyloid beta, I call it a beta. So uh, uh, the A beta and the prion protein are both antimicrobial peptides, meaning that they're used to fight off disease in the brain. And okay. that's why gingivitis. And you might have heard the story the, a while back. They just came out and said herpes was associated with, with Alzheimer's. And those are all microbes that infect the brain. And I suspect what happens, well, I, this is my hypothesis, and it's just a hypothesis. So don't, <laughs> don't, when I talk about this, I talk about this in class a lot. But what ends up happening is, you know, th those proteins are really important to memory and they're also really important to fighting off diseases. And as you get older, they kind of mess up, right? They're kind of, they're kind of like, they get cleaned up a lot by your brain, right? By, you know, sleeping, your body comes in, does some housekeeping, cleans them up. But as you get older, you can become less efficient at that. And so that's probably some of the reason why we're starting to see some of these things that are associated with it you know, like gingivitis and herpes and some of these other viruses and uh, bacteria. That's why we're starting to see this. But that's, you know, anyway, so that's probably why we're starting to see these things um, associated with Alzheimer's. So anyway, yeah, every I, went off, time... I went off on a tangent already. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, well, that happens me two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> that happens with all of my episodes. I even had one. I don't generally work from notes, but the last one I worked from notes and it still was like 
this long conversation and I'm like, I just, I hope people like the conversational format of the podcast because I don't seem to be able to get away from that, but. Well, that's what we, I think that's what we, that's what I think our people, uh, you know, our viewers like to listen is just listen to people who are very knowledgeable about the subject matter and talk about it because I think that's really, I think that's where we're going to start to see really big areas of improvement in, in some of these things. So. Well, I've always said that one of the biggest issues is the stigma. Like my mom knew she had a problem and people that have listened to past episodes know we had a business together. She wasn't writing down instructions when the client expected to pick up the order, you know, minor things like that. And I started basically hovering and supervising. And there was an episode where she didn't recognize her own handwriting and it was definite an oh crap moment. Mm-hmm. And she was like, I don't want, I, you know, I don't want to end up like my mother because my great, my maternal grandmother and my maternal great grandmother had no memories at the end of their life. So yay for me, three generations and I have to be the one that stops it. So I, she had all this denial and she didn't, didn't do any of the things that we've now learned you could do. Like I exercise regularly. I do not eat fast food or processed food or my worst thing is I am a sugar fiend, but I've learned how to reduce that in my, in my eating. And I can't really get rid of the artificial sweeteners. Just can't. Inflammation would be, you know, that's one of the things that I think that we don't quite understand. The sugar is really bad for you because it increased, it helped, it really exacerbates the inflammation that you're going to see so keeping your sugar intake low is really super important and having good mouth health obviously with that new gingivitis thing is really important and so the other things that decrease inflammation are your omega-3 fatty acids and so when we talk about when when they um that's like your western diet your beef right yep like i always (laughs) tell my students Hey, I love me a really good corn fed beef steak. There's nothing better, but you know what? That omega six to omega three ratio, which is really important in inflammation, you know, decreasing, not only is it bad for your, your, you know, your glucose, you know, your, uh, carbohydrates and you know, your fat and all that good stuff. It's just really bad for inflammation. You need to be eating fish. You need to be eating, you know, taking your omega three supplements because those decrease the inflammation that decreases, you know, all the diseases, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, MS, all those things help out. So, well, I take the supplements, but I don't like any fish, (laughs) none of it. No tuna fish sandwich, nothing. I don't like the smell. Grass fed beef. So, well, we do get that occasionally. We do, we get the meal delivery from Blue Apron. So their meat is hormone hormone free, which is great for somebody like myself at 52. As soon as we started eating the hormone free meat more regularly, because we only get three meals from them a week, I noticed other changes in me that were positive for somebody who's 52. I actually started last year. So um, we all know what comes with, comes with that age for ladies. So. <laughs> um, and I, like I said, I exercise six days a week. Once we stop having wet wet i mean we're having an atmospheric river so i'll but go back to walking my three dogs i have three golden retrievers oh i've had cool. dogs all my life so i was very excited to talk to you guys about our topic which was canine caregivers although what we're yeah. talking about now before is super interesting <laughs> well this is the background right i think it's really important that we michelle needs to jump in and help me out keep me on <laughs> That's her main sure. focus. Um, but um, so, yeah, so we, we have people on all the, uh, regularly that talk about service dogs. And I'm re- we would really like to raise awareness about how Alzheimer's patients could be, could be helped with service dogs. So service dogs can do all kinds of just daily tasks. And they can also just facilitate, you know, they can be trained to keep the, you know, Alzheimer's patients safe and out of harm's way and guide them. So uh, we were just curious if if you've seen that role at all, or if that's something that we would, we we should be raising more awareness about. Oh no, definitely raising more awareness because as I've said, I, you know, 52 had dogs Uh all my life, completely familiar with therapy dogs and 
other canine companions or service dogs. I've got a um, high school friend who's got the dog that sniffs out the blood sugar issues. Yeah. Uh, Excellent. Yeah. And just what her dog does for her just blows my mind. And reading the article that you guys sent me, I was like, okay, well, physical things, I can understand how a dog can help with that. But when you can't remember that you fed the dog three times, because my mom also had dogs all her, well, most of her life. And up until August 2018, she had her poodle in the memory residence with her, which uh -huh. in the beginning was a benefit for my mom because she did not think she belonged there. She begged my sister and I not to leave her there. Why couldn't she live with one of us? Mm -hmm. uh, my sister's four and a half years younger and has school-aged children, so there's a big reason she couldn't live with my sister. And my husband and I are self-employed, so, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, there's just, it, and it, she needed a lot more help than either of us are physically or mentally capable of doing. I knew if she lived with me, it'd be a week and one of us would be dead. I, I have one, one child. There's a reason for that. You know, <laughs> it's like we got through the terrible twos and the clingy fours and it was like, you know what, this is okay. We'll just, let's we'll keep moving forward. We don't need to repeat any of this stuff. <laughs> So, <laughs> I think we can um, all she's a great to that. kid. So absolutely. Um, so I had not heard of canine caregivers, and I was really super fascinated reading the article. So why don't you tell me? Um, let's back up just a little bit because I'm sure people are aware of therapy dogs. They go into hospitals or nursing homes, and they kind of just provide comfort. My neighbor is actually. Uh, she owns a dog named Bella, and that's what Bella does. Bella's a therapy dog. Bella is amazing. Bella has trained my middle dog on how to behave properly around small dogs. It's, it, it's fascinating. My youngest dog is a runner, so we, we don't get to socialize with the other dogs as much because we live in a golf course neighborhood, and the dogs would go out, run on the green, and play with each other while my youngest runs on the green, chases the rabbits, and doesn't come back till he's exhausted. So. We can't do that. Um, so what traits does a dog need to have before they can be considered for training to be a canine caregiver? That's a tricky word to say. Oh, we just talked about this one, Ben. Yes, go for it. Oh, no, no, no. This is all you. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, okay, so let's start with, I'm going to start with a couple things that dogs can definitely be used for. And so I'm... Uh, um, I'm going to start with the search and rescue one, tracking one first. Okay. Um, that one is something that already exists in the communities right now and can be utilized. It drives me bonkers because I'm on a search and rescue team and, you know, our search and rescue team does tracking, trailing, and uh, cadaver search, you know, finding, mm -hmm. finding uh, bodies, dead, dead bodies. Yes. I want to be sensitive, and that, and I was trying to think of a good word to say that, but there is not really a good word to say that. They they find the dead um, very well. But the two that the two that really um, I think need more first off more awareness are the search and rescue teams because it happens to me all the time. Mike, I'll be sitting around and well, I'll get an alert from I I don't know if you guys have these. We have apps for our communities called ones. Our the one we have is called Next Door that tells mm -hmm. us you know, what's going on in the neighborhood. We get alert probably once a month. Hey, so-and-so is missing. A kid's missing. An Alzheimer's patient wandered off. And my son-in-law almost invariably calls me up and says, Ben, why don't you go search for that person? And I'm like, hey, I'm a deputy search and rescue person. And I cannot just go out and self-deploy. I just can't go out and look for those people. And I, it drives me crazy that our local law enforcement don't use us in the capacity, in the capacity, we have tracking and trailing dogs that could very easily go find Alzheimer's patients who, you know, who wander off. And I know there's GPS things that they have and all other kind of stuff, but a, a dogs can definitely help in that capacity very easily. And I don't know well, why we don't use those more often for that. Would you say that it's, it's a lack of knowledge that they just don't know enough? A about lot of times it is. Abilities? Yeah, a lot of times it is, but it's also a little bit of, um, Sometimes it's just political, right? There's sometimes these law enforcement people get a little bit, you know, and I think it's really important for your viewers, Jennifer, to go, hey, look, you know what? Why don't you call in the search and rescue? There's a lot of places that do a really good job with that, but there's also places that don't use them at all. And it's, 
you know, I know that like, for instance, in our community, we have probably four search and rescue dogs that could find Alzheimer's patients very quickly. And even in urban environments, you know, a lot of times we think of search and rescue, we think in the middle of the mountains somewhere, but in an urban environment, they can, there's a lot of dogs that are very good at trailing, can track down people who are missing of any flavor in any environment. They can, they smell very well. So I think it's really important. I would think it'd be really important if, you know, you have a, someone who is missing or, you know, have, has a tendency to wander off, you know, know what the, what the resources in your community are in relation to that. And then, you know, ask those law enforcement to utilize those resources. They exist. They're there. They, tr they would love to help. That's what they're there for. I would love to get a call to, to go help. And I don't, I don't need news coverage. I don't need anything. The dog, my dog, I don't know. I talk about Siggy all the time. Siggy loves to work and it would just be one big game for her and she would love <laughs> to go help, you know? Well, and it's important when even like right now, cause we're having rain here. I'm in Northern California. I'm in the San Francisco Bay area. It's not cold. We did have a couple weeks where it was cold, not compared to you. You're in Ohio, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm in North Dakota. And, oh, North Dakota, and even worse. <laughs> yeah, I'm in North like Carolina. Worse. Okay. Um, but well, even, either either place, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. We don't generally get snow in where I live. I back up to a mountain that tops out at about 3,800 feet, and it had snow on it for the better part of a week, which is extremely rare. We'll get snow. Usually, it melts off by lunchtime as the daytime temperature warms up. This was like in the 30s and 40s for over a week, which this is a no-brainer for me. I don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> but even in, <laughs> even in mild cold temperatures like we're having now, if you get wet from the rain and you're, now you're damp and the temperature drops, you, know, you could have hypothermia rapidly and the dog is going to be able to find you a whole lot faster than humans. But I have Absolutely. good news for you. My husband has a client who trains police dogs. So yes. I'm going to make sure he knows that this is something they need to start focusing on because, you know, like I said, in California, one in three people die from Alzheimer's. That's a large part of the population. Yeah, so, absolutely. You yeah, know, and we it's live. It's really simple. And, it, and um, the training isn't that, I mean, the training is extensive, but there's lots of people who do it all the time. So. I believe it. And I know just for listeners who may or may not be super familiar with dogs, if you're familiar with a bloodhound and they got those long droopy ears, mm -hmm. those droopy ears, when they're sniffing the ground, sweep up the scents up into their nose. And that's one of the reasons that bloodhounds are great trackers. Yes. Oh, I didn't not, know that. I, I, like I said, I've had dogs all my life and I knew bloodhounds weren't real smart. <laughs> I've, I grew up with poodles and golden retrievers and yes. we're on our fourth fifth and sixth golden retriever number six who's almost two is wicked smart they all keep getting smarter so yes. dog number seven is going to be telling me what to do well i have a dog problem. that tells me what to do all the time and we have two goldens on our team on our search and rescue teams and the thing about goldens like siggy as a german shepherd who's my dog doesn't like other people right i mean she's she'll tolerate you but you're just your background to her the goldens just love to interact with people and that's what they're bred to do and so they make also really good live find you know tra tracking and trailing dogs so um the different here I'll go, I'll go a little bit i'll go a little bit deep on you jennifer so the bloodhound is a tracker knows the ground looking at your footprints sniffing your footprints a lot of goldens are what we call trailers they get their head up and they they don't their nose is not necessarily on the ground is generally in the air looking for air rafts going through and so goldens make excellent trailing dogs so german shepherds can do either commonly you'll see them do both the thing about a bloodhounds are and i'm going to offend all my bloodhound people but <laughs> they are dumber than a post like they're like you know uh, that we all love bloodhounds we all love watching the old westerns that where the bloodhound is tracking and that's what they're designed to do and they're great at it and we have we have some we have a bloodhound on our team and I love just, I love it when they just start, you know, start wailing and howling like they're get on a trail and they get all excited. It's really <laughs> a lot of fun. Um, so, but anyway, then the, the trailing dogs, are the ones that really can just cut down uh, and find the people really fast. So a, tra a tracking dog is really, really important for establishing 
you know, you probably, you know, direction of direction, of, uh, direction of travel and all those kind of things. So anyway, those are really important components. One, one thing I, somebody told me recently that I thought was interesting and I wish I could have somewhat experimented with this with my mom, but if a person with memory loss goes missing, they generally walk in the direction of their dominant hand. So if they leave their front door, they will probably go to the right. Now, the reason that I, and it makes sense really, but where my parents lived to the left and across the street, just a smidgen, was, is an elementary school. To the right is, it's like a little opening where the street was supposed to go through and then there's more houses down the street. So there's, I would think it would have been 50-50 with my mom. She might have gone right because that's the direction the dog would generally go over to the open space where people walk their dogs. There's lots of scents, but then there's the school with all the kids that she loves to watch. So it was, it was interesting and it's, it'd be something to kind of see, like if you just walk out front with your loved one, which direction do they generally kind of lean towards was interesting, but I well, that information is really helpful when you're talking about dogs because they, they, they will actually, they can tell that, it, you know, you think they, they do struggle on, you know, hard surfaces like concrete and asphalt, but they have a pretty good sense they, that they can, they can do a pretty good job there. So, yes. I believe it. Knowing, I've all those things, knowing all those things would be very valuable for care. Well, th this is why I talk to so many different people about so many different things because the more we know, the better we can care for our loved ones and our community and just, you know, hopefully make this disease a little less traumatic because it's already bad enough as it is. We don't need loved ones or neighbors wandering off. I have a neighbor with Parkinson's and I worry about him regularly. I try not to, but he's wildly taller than his wife. Mm -hmm. And he's made comments he doesn't want to become a burden. And it's like, how do I basically tell him that, you know, at some point, she is not going to be able to take care of you yeah. without sounding terrible. <laughs> right. And my mom actually has Parkinson's, so I can uh, relate to that too. And Ben, I think you can talk a little bit about um, the relationship between Parkinson's and dementia. There's a very strong genetic relationship there. There very much is, and you, I could give an entire, I give an entire lecture in biochemistry <laughs> about, and it's another protein misfolding disease. It's very similar, you know, tau also, uh, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to give like 30 seconds and then I'll be done, I promise. Okay. But um, tau <laughs> is associated with, uh, with microtubules and Parkinson's can also be, and it's a protein misfolding disease and Parkinson's um, also has a component where the, the proteins aggregate and cause damage and inflammation. So it's just, they're very, they're very, they're in the same family of diseases. Let's just put it that way. And there's a genetic component to that. So Parkinson's is very heritable because these protein misfolding diseases obviously translate genetically. So it's very, very, they're very, very related, both of them. So. Well, I hope Alzheimer's is not as inheritable. Right, and there is a component, a small component, but it's not anywhere as her near as heritable as Parkinson's. Parkinson's, you can pretty much, there's a lot of components to Parkinson's that are very heritable. Mm. Well, that's good news for me, no Parkinson's, but the mm -hmm. memory loss is pretty strong. Yes. I just hope I take after my dad's side of the family. I do in a lot of respects, in physical respects, um, I did inherit the fat gene from my dad's side of the family. <laughs> I used to weigh over 200 pounds. So for those people who are going to see this on YouTube, eventually, once I get that all set up, I don't weigh over 200 pounds anymore. And that's one of the things I started doing to, to lose the weight. I had to just continuously find the path that led me to the, the path that worked. Yes. And it, and it was because I had a client who said, oh my gosh, you have a family history of diabetes and you're overweight, you're screwed. And a eh, little genetic, you know, part of me is like, ha, huh, no, I'm not screwed. I will show you. And Good so you. I have kept most of it off. Turning 50 didn't help. All that change of life stuff is not helping. So I'm struggling to lose some of that weight again. But that's one of the important things for you know, Alzheimer's is eat properly, sleep properly, exercise regularly, 
challenge your brain, which I do with this podcast. I've learned way more stuff than I thought I needed to know. And I learned stuff like from talking to you that I would never learn if I hadn't, don't talk to people. So absolutely. That's, I feel the same way. Well, and I've changed my lifestyle completely too, based on, well, I hit, I hit 40. So, and I got this Every- nice letter from my dad saying, hey, you better get your act together. And I was like, oh, I guess I better. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, I have a grandmother who will be, my dad's mom will be 101 March 28th. So in a month. So, and she's wow. really fine. She's um, blind, mostly blind from glaucoma. Mm-hmm. Um, so I hope since I got the fat gene on dad's side of the family, I'm hoping I take after her. I do with the Henri part, so <laughs> that's what I meant by that little genetic component. It's like, oh yeah, Henri is definitely a family trait. So yes, I can relate to that as well. So, anyway, okay, so back the on the other, dogs. Yes, well, which is I, this is all good stuff. So the other things that dogs can do, and there are Alzheimer's dogs. They're not as they're not as prevalent as some of the other service dogs. Like you, your friend, you you mentioned with the the diabetic detection dogs. Diabetes is also a really, really common disease, and, and that's also increasing based on, you know, some of the our diet and other things that are really, really bad for us. But so some of the things that we that we can train dogs to do with that Alzheimer's, and I suspect it's it's probably early, more early than late onset. So um, dogs are really good at behavior interruption, which I um, you're going to have to explain if that's I, I'm I haven't had the the misfortune of having to train or deal with caregiving of Alzheimer's patients yet. Um, <laughs> Cross your fingers. <laughs> yes, exactly. But behavior interruption is something we, co- we can train very easily into dogs. And so if there's something that, and I know this is very common and I've seen a lot of videos on from students in this where they have the, the Alzheimer's patient will get into routines that are really not good for them. And you can train the dog to interrupt and disrupt repetitive, or behaviors that would be dangerous that you can kind of anticipate, which I, a golden would be a perfect dog for this type of, you know, just interrupting, you know, so and helping out. <laughs> I laugh because, well, my, do- my dogs have me trained. The girl dog who's four and a half, <laughs> she's laying in the hallway. I'm coming down, you know, from one part of the house to the other. She just rolls over, flips the back leg open, and looks at me like, you will scratch me. <laughs> Do not walk by without paying toll. And she knows it works. She is so smart. She knows when I'm making dinner that if she sits up real tall and she smiles and her eyes sparkle, I don't know how she manages that one. And she can see both of my eyes. She knows she, I can see her. And she knows that she, I know she's begging. And it well, almost part of it. works. Yeah, that's she, part of it because what when you know, I mean obviously they can pull they can pull the patient out of distra- behaviors they can also put people into routines and they can relax them and calm them which I suspect are all really really important when we're talking about dealing with and because we see this all the time with other with other diseases as well when they do that so well there's something soothing just for everybody about petting the dog is it's soothing it brings your blood pressure down Yep. And, and there's some, some, some of the patients get to be combative. I've seen that Alzheimer's mm-hmm. patients combative and they can, dogs can absolutely help calm and break the cycle of that process, that escalation process. Yeah. So. I learned recently one trigger for like being combative. Mm-hmm. And if you think about, and this is uh, the reason I'm bringing this up is I don't think I've ever talked about this on the podcast before, but if you're, processor is not working right Mm -hmm. and somebody helps you know they they come in your room first thing in the morning and they say hi ben how is how are you doing did you sleep well and they're just like all chipper and they're in your face asking questions and you're trying to like function like you know how we are first thing in the morning before we've had our Mm -hmm. caffeine well if Mm -hmm. your brain is even worse than that and somebody's just in your face and your brain is not processing what they're saying it the gal, she's called the dementia whisperer. She kind of um, explained it as if somebody was speaking in a foreign language or gibberish, but you could understand it was a question. It was like, ah, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> You'd be like, get away from me. And so they have yes. a tendency to shove people 
or yell or run away, you know, and it's all, it's, it's amazing how somebody with Alzheimer's can totally pick up on your emotions. You don't have to say a word. Like I do not visit my mom if I am tired or stressed. I missed the day, the Monday after her birthday and I felt really guilty. Her birthday was on a Saturday and I go Mondays, but I was, I had a cold and I was tired and I was just like, I could probably deal with mom maybe. But when you throw in her friend who is almost a constant companion, I'm like, there's no way I can deal with both these ladies. So we're just going to have to skip it today. And I always say I'm going to go later in the week and that never happens. Monday is this, I'm very uh, organized and scheduled. So it's like, if I don't go Mondays, it'll be the next Monday and catch up. But they're, I think that's one reason that dogs can be so good with them because they are also very attuned to the person's emotions. Like my youngest golden, if you cry, he will crawl up in your lap and he, he's a small golden. So he weighs about 60 pounds. So 60 pounds in your lap's a little much, but he will crawl in your lap and lick your face and wag his tail and he'll do everything he can to, to end the crying, which of course he's male. So there's probably that too. <laughs> and that's what they're good at, right? That's what they're good at. Well, golden retrievers, they don't know anybody that's not the next best friend or food dispenser. <laughs> That's true. So how can these canine caregivers, like I said, that's, that's tricky to say. Um, I, I read in the article that they can help get owners home. They can remain with the owner and bark for help if the owner refuses to go home. Absolutely. These are all, these, and these are all skills that, uh, that existing service dogs are very easily trained to do. They, their dogs are very easily trained to keep you on track and they can be used to, you know, if you're going the wrong way, they can lead you the right way. They can bark. They can find help. They can help you cross the street. They can keep you safe until, you know, and you can put a GPS tracker on your dog. You can use the dog as a tether so that, you know, the dog will follow, you know, let's say you have, you're taking your mom out and you can have the dog on a leash with your mom and the dog will just follow you as a tether and so there's and you can have it or you can just have a second leash attached you know and then you're not you know you're not worried about your mom can have a little bit of freedom mm -hmm. and a little bit of enjoyment and not be feel like you know hey they're micromanaging my, where I am and you can have a little bit of freedom to know that you're not you know gonna lose your mom in the middle of you know target or something or you know wherever you're wherever you're doing something so or a festival or you know something like that so they're, they're really good at, the, at those type of things as well and you know the other thing that they're really good at and michelle probably could talk to this is they're just really good companions because a lot of times i suspect that alzheimer's patients are very isolated and they feel isolated and that can be their my my grandfather uh had got he got a little bit too crazy of a dog but <laughs> he got a puppy which you know and he suffers from diabetes and he's very isolated after, especially after my grandmother passed away. And that dog is just his best friend. And I think that's a really, really important component of, of the process as well. So it is, and it helps them if they are still independent enough to go out and walk and meet the neighbors. It also helps keep them social that way, gives them something social to do which yes. is good. Unfortunately for my mom's dog, she didn't, well, my dad was never good at walking her and my mom was very good at, rem at remembering that the dog needed to eat. <laughs> she never right. remembered that the dog had eaten. So the poor dog should have weighed about 15 pounds and was rapidly approaching 30. Oh. So, <laughs> yeah. She was this a black, my... black miniature poodle and she was like a tank. <laughs> this is why I like German Shepherds. My German Shepherds, I can just free feed and they don't have to worry. They, they don't, they won't overeat. So you could just have, you know, you just have unlimited food, unlimited water, and they just eat whenever they need to. I had, my first two Goldens were like that, but let's see, first two, so four, three, four, five, and six. They go in there, <laughs> they suck up the food like a high powered vacuum, come in the kitchen, burp at you and stare at you like, yo, where's dinner? <laughs> it's pretty funny there was a time this shows you how smart these dogs are my husband and I went out to dinner daughter was studying she said can you bring me back some to go okay great so 
when we got home, the dog looked at me, looked at where the dog food is, looked at me, looked where, hey, hello, I'm hungry. And I thought, oh, well, she normally feeds them. When she eats, she hasn't eaten, so she hasn't fed the dog. So I didn't bother asking, fed the dogs. She heard the kibble hit the bowls and the food was gone before she could holler, I already fed the dogs. <laughs> <laughs> and there was one day they almost got three dinners because they conned two of us and they were working on the third person First and the thing. third. Yeah. And it was like, and they were Oscar award winning, you know, acting because they acted like they had not been fed. Of course. That's and my dog. I call him a hobbit. He okay. wants second breakfast and second dinners and oh yeah. <laughs> well, the funniest thing is my oldest is 11, the oldest dog. And he loves pancakes. We have pancakes and scrambled Ooh. eggs on Mondays before we go to spin. When we come home, we unlock the door. Now he has um, some nerve degeneration in his back legs. So he's not speedy and he's a little bit heavier than he needs to be because walking for the last uh, four months has been um, not something that's easily doable. It's not enjoyable in the rain and all the smoke we had in November. So oh, yeah. we're a little off our walking game right now. It, that'll change in the next two, three weeks, probably. But he, I mean, we're, we're like literally one foot in the door, not, not measurement wise, but like one foot is in the doorway and he's pew, down the hall to the kitchen and he's looking at the counter and he looks at you and he looks at the counter and he's like, yo, give me the pancake. Give me yeah. the pancake. I'm ready. I'm ready. Oh, and, and he knows. And it's and if we go in the same type of clothes to the gym and we come home, it doesn't have to, you know, it confuses him. And he's like, wait, they're wearing spin clothes. There must be pancakes. It's just the correlation good. is hysterical. Yes, they're very good at classical conditioning. You can <laughs> that is true. And they're very good at training you. Oh, so yes. Very classical conditioning. So they, uh, they definitely understand that. And they definitely can take advantage of that whole scenario. So the other thing I, I was curious about what your thoughts on would be uh, there's an entirely emerging field. And, and I say emerging, it's, it's, it's getting quite popular, but therapy dogs in, in institutional, we talked with Lorette uh, the other day uh, on a podcast where she's training more and more institutional dogs to just help. And I was curious if you've seen that or if you think that would be a, a, a very valuable sort of resource for some of these uh, large facilities. I have not. My mom is in a large residence. There's the assisted living, which I don't know how many apartments that is. And then the memory care is about 32 residents if they're fully occupied, mm -hmm. which currently they're not. They renovated over the summer and I don't, I don't know if that triggered some stuff, but <laughs> it's been quite a few people who have died, which is, oh. you know, not uncommon. Oh, sure. And people that have moved out for one, you know, families run out of money. I know one gal that my mom was really close to was getting very, very bossy and very, very obnoxious and somewhat paranoid. Mm -hmm. um, she was becoming less enjoyable to spend time with unless I took both of them out. And then mm -hmm. it wasn't too bad. Um, she moved out at the beginning of November and I was a little concerned when I found out that was happening because she was really close with my mom, but my mom's close to another gal now, so it's okay. <laughs> yes. But I think it could help because there's, there's one gal where my mom lives whose go-to phrase is help me, help me, somebody help me. Mm -hmm. And there are times I, I've now gotten accustomed to it i make sure if i'm there and i've heard her say that multiple times and she's in her room i make sure the care staff is aware and they'll be like oh yeah we just checked on her 10 minutes ago okay just double checking right that's you know, a, a little unnerving when somebody and it's it's a monotone she's not yelling it's just like a, con, a continuous monotone help me help me and it's ugh, after you've heard that for about five minutes <laughs> you want to help her any way you can Absolutely. I would think a dog could help soothe her, cons whatever is triggering the, I need attention, therefore I need help. There's yeah. something going on in her mind that's triggering the help me, help me, I need help. So this is one of the reasons we're really excited about talking about this topic. Because I, right. I, I, the, 
you know, these are not cheap dogs, right? I don't, I, um, they're expensive and I don't think anyone is, but they're an important, they could be an important tool for those kind of scenarios. If you could put in an institutional dog to help that, you know, you could just leave the dog with the person for a little bit and help, you know, soothe that patient. You, you can imagine a golden retriever or a lab or some of these other, you know, even some of the, like a Papillon or some of these other small dogs, lap dogs would be very, very helpful in just breaking those cycles of, you know, that they, that, that some of the patients get into. So the only thing I, that I would see as a challenge besides the cost. And I used to photograph a local um, police department's canines. Uh huh. So I'm aware of the cost. <laughs> yes. And they, they have, this is going to cost about, you know, sometimes it's, 20 to up, upwards of $60,000 to train some of these dogs. So it's, it's not cheap. I know when they bought them and we're talking probably a dozen years ago when I was working with them, they were like 10 grand. So that doesn't surprise me. Although 60 makes me want to faint just a little bit. It does. Um, I see two things. My mom had her dog and there was another resident in the memory care who had his two little dogs. He's mm -hmm. actually moved over to the assisted living side, which is interesting. I don't know how you graduate to that, but it, it's definitely better for him. Mm -hmm. um, his mind is not great, but he's, he was still really independent. Mm -hmm. But I noticed with those three dogs, mom and Xavier's dogs, a lot of the other residents who weren't dog people, maybe didn't have dogs of their own growing up or as you know adults, sometimes were a little standoffish. They didn't want the dog come near them. Don't want the dog lick me. They seem to have a little bit of fear. So I can that, see that. Yeah. So that would be one thing. I'm not sure how you like. We don't use German shepherds to start off. That's right? for sure. <laughs> or Belgian <laughs> Malinois. Yeah. Yeah. You get a Malinois in there and it'd be, it'd be a terrorist organization, you know, terrorist type situation. Yeah. No, you'd have to have a, a fluffy golden retriever with their happy faces Yes. I see that as being a little bit of a challenge and with people who are memory impaired, I don't know how you, how you would fix that and fix not necessarily being the best word, but on the oh, flip side of the coin, I see a dog being very beneficial to the care staff because when you've listened to somebody yelling, you know, help me, help me, help me, help me for half an hour. Yes. You know, there is not enough training to, make it so that your nerves don't just want to go in there and help her. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and so, and it gets to the point where they don't ignore it. They kind of like tune out 75% of it. So they're still tuned into her if something changes. But well, that's that, what if you had an institutional, I mean, you, you wouldn't necessarily have to have uh, that person, that patient wouldn't necessarily have to have a dog themselves, but you could have an institutional dog, bring the dog in, and that's where those repetitive behaviors, right? That help me, help me would be a repetitive behavior. And you could take that dog and help teach that dog to break that repetitive behavior as an institutional dog. And you wouldn't that would necessarily- That would be great. Yeah, wouldn't it? You could just bring that dog in there and that dog, you know, simple things like licking faces or, you know, the person reaches down to pet are going to, you know, get that person out of that, you know, spiraling cycle of whatever behavior is i mean they you know and you can train a service dog to shut off lights and pick up remotes and all those kind of things too that that normal service dogs do but as an in and so everybody wouldn't have to have a third you know a, a an alzheimer's service dog if you did an institution-wide one that would be an amazing resource for facilities i can totally see that because the way my mom's uh residence is shaped it's basically a square and in the middle is a beautiful courtyard now the challenge with my mom with any of the dogs is there wasn't a dog door so somebody had to let my mom's dog out mm -hmm. and because of the fact that my dad insisted on getting a puppy when they shouldn't have <laughs> I, I begged him to get a go to poodle rescue it is a, it is a challenge people love puppies Puppies are fine, and then they grow into their teenage years, and no one likes, I always say this to everyone, no one likes a teenage dog. No one. You have to be crazy to like it. You know, like from the point that they're probably six months to 18 months to two years, they are, they're an awkward teenager, and that's just, there's no two ways about that, so. True. My youngest, we got at seven months, and he was, he's a rescue. Mm -hmm. He was living outside with his brothers. 
So he loves very much the comforts of home and the nice food and the bed and all that stuff. Open the back door to the 400 plus acres of open space and it takes him literally four seconds or less to go from inside the house to over the back fence. Right. And he chases the bunnies and the birds and he just runs and he runs and he runs. And I don't know that he will ever get over being wild. He's got that wild streak. And then like I was getting out of the shower after the gym this morning and he's taking a nap on his doggy bed. I'm like, I don't understand you. You're like a little schizophrenic, (laughs) but he's totally a love. Oh my God. He's. I mean, you can train that out. You can train that out of dogs. Um, It's possible. I just have German shepherds who don't ever want to leave me. It's just that they're genetically, they don't, they, they're not going to. Like, Siggy's not going to go more than 20 feet from me. Or she's, then she's going to come back and check with me, make sure I'm okay. Oh, well, you, my, like, oldest, my oldest one is three feet. He is a total <laughs> mama's dog. And Absolutely. so he's, the, I, the other day I was working on my computer, and he's literally laying under the office chair with his head on the leg. <laughs> just not at all comfortable, I would think. Doesn't look comfortable. And, you know, after a while, I'm like, I think it's very insulting that I am working here and there is serious snoring going on under my chair. <laughs> I'd like to take a nap or do something other than work. Yes. And so I leaned over because I have my iPhone next to me at my computer so I can listen to podcasts if I'm not listening to my, and editing my own. And I just leaned over. It wasn't easy. And I snapped a picture kind of blind of him. And I got a little video too. I'm like, seriously dog like you gotta be snoring under the chair (laughs) absolutely but yeah no i see the um if you have a resident a care residence where like where my mom lives if you had somebody in the assisted living that could come over and maybe bring the dog during the day although i can see a lot of times they'd need them at night i don't know how a dog do you think a dog would um function okay if they lived in the memory care 24 7 yeah okay so dogs don't have to here's the cool part dogs don't we have a kind of a a thing to think or a tendency to anthropomorphize on dogs meaning we say if if i like it then the dog is gonna like it just like um you know you were anthropomorphizing about your dog not working i do that all the time we do that all the time i do that all the time everyone does that all the time here's the thing about dogs Dogs can be in a crate a, a long time and it will not affect them at all. So at night you can log, your, log the dog up in a crate and they're actually really happy. That, that's their home. That's their comfort zone. They're perfectly comfortable and happy being there. They get tons of stimulation during the day and you can lock them up at night. And some people are like, oh, that's cruel. Oh, that, but the dog does not mind it at all. In fact, some like my dog, uh, Odin, he has, we give him the, op- the option where to sleep. He chooses to sleep in his crate every single night. He can sleep on our bed with us. He would rather not. <laughs> whatever, whatever floats your boat. So there are plenty of dogs who would be perfectly com- comfortable just going, and he's a dog, he's a total social butterfly. He loves us. He loves actually snuggling with us. But at night, he likes to have his space. He likes to be in his crate. He likes, you know, to be able to move around. It's it's, uh, you know, it's soothing for them. So, and, you know, you can get into a lot of psychology. Uh, Temple Grandin does a really good discussion of this when she talks about cows and some of the other th- some of these behaviors and that, that dogs have. Dogs are fine in a crate. So you could, you know, the night staff, if they felt like they needed, they could bring them out. But if they didn't, if they want, if they need a break, dogs can just go, the institutional dog could just go in their crate and be fine. You know, for hours on end, they don't have to be, you don't have to entertain the dogs. That's the cool part. So, Because I was reading in your article that they can also help with sundowners, but I don't remember it specifically saying why, how they did that. Are you familiar with sundowners? I don't recall. I don't know. I'm not familiar. You want to describe it to me? It usually happens towards the end of the day, generally around sundown. Now, if you think about sunset time, so like, Right when the world is in between daytime and nighttime, it's uh-huh. kind of flat. There's not a lot of contrast. That probably makes more sense to Michelle being a photographer. <laughs> yep, that it's, twilight hour, yes. Yeah, they seem to get more confused. 
Okay. And sometimes the confusion can be pretty wild. Sure. I've only experienced it a little bit with my mom. We were driving from my hometown to hers. I took the back route, which is windy, twisty roads around the hills and very few street lights. It's all country kind of road. And man, the questions she started asking me were really crazy. <laughs> Just like out of the blue. And it was when my dad was in the hospital before he came home on hospice. So I was stressed and I didn't need all these wackadoodle questions. Sure. Well, I mean, if you think about that time of day and the lighting, it can be very confusing to clear minded people. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's harder to see, it's harder to differentiate between um, a dog and a, a dark dog in a road, for exactly. instance. Exactly. You know, it's so I can definitely understand how that can be very, very confusing and very disorienting. I can tell you exactly how dogs can help with this. So I don't know if your dogs do this, Jennifer or Michelle, but Siggy knows my routine down to the second. Yes, I yes. know that way too. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> it wouldn't matter what was going on. I, I, you know, I turn around in the morning after I've had my breakfast, I turn around and Siggy's not anywhere around and I go and I I can find her in the bathroom. She's waiting for me to take a shower. I have a routine. She knows exactly what's next. <laughs> you can train a dog to do follow a routine and help mitigate all kinds of confusion. And they can also, you know, take if there's if the, if the patient is exhibiting any kind of confusion behavior, you could train them to take them to the hospital staff, or you could train them to do, you know, or to the administrative staff, or whatever. You there's tons of things like that that dogs can you know, triggers and and routines and all those things dogs could absolutely be helpful in mitigating and, and solving those kind of problems so it's interesting fact. many of the residents where my mom lives mm -hmm. are not they're not super social most of them are fairly well no a few of them are in wheelchairs they're, my mom's next door neighbor she she walks she, i don't want to say she's a wanderer because she can't wander off Mm -hmm. But she walks, you know, every inch of the residence, but she doesn't really speak. She mumbles and she's mm -hmm. Irish. So what she mumbles sometimes is not English. <laughs> if you listen carefully and, and cross your fingers really hard, sometimes she'll pop out an English word and sometimes you can grab it and maybe respond to her in some sort of reasonable way. Cause she knows exactly what she's saying or asking right. you. And you look at her and you're like, eh, I have no clue what you're saying. <laughs> it's frustrating to her. And I would think that, it, I don't know if she's a dog person, because I can't ask. I can't remember her interacting with my mom's dog, but I could see throwing the ball for the dog or just interacting with the dog would at least give her something else to do besides roam around. I mean, they just renovated this past summer. And I swear that woman's going to wear out the carpet again. <laughs> it's just like yeah. she just goes around well, and around and around. Dogs are very good at also just reading your emotions. And mm -hmm. so you can imagine you're communicating with them in a foreign language and your body language means a lot. And her body language, the dogs can be very easily trained to interact and interface when she's having a, you know, those kind of situations. So I, I honestly think that would be a very, very valuable tool in the tool, tool belt of you know, in those kind of environments, not, not in, in a huge institutional environment, as well as just maybe not in, in late stage Alzheimer's where, you know, you're going to forget to feed the dog. That would be a bad, I think mean, that'd be a, a situation where you'd have to step in. Well, that was the problem with Ho or Holly was the previous dog. Misty was my mom's dog. And the reason that she was almost double her body weight is because the residents fed her from the table. The dog didn't sure. eat dog food. Sure. Is we had put in place, mom had been there about six months, close to six months, and the executive director and the med techs and myself, we put together a plan to feed the dog properly. Yeah. And it was the dogs would remain in the in the room during mealtime. The med techs would feed her twice a day because that's what dogs need and they knew how much to feed her. Yeah, that took all of hmm, half of a meal, if that long, before the dog realized she was getting left out. 
and she shrieked and howled and carried on. You would have thought somebody had sure. released the hellhound. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, she was terrible. And the, oh, and being small, she like shriek, bark, and howl. Oh, it was, oh, it was horrible. I mean, they would make a great Halloween soundtrack. Absolutely. So of course, all these, you know, very sweet old ladies would be, would feel terrible for this dog who's being horribly mistreated and they'd let her out. Sure. And then they'd feed her. I mean, they would actually like one lady cut up half of the meat from her di from her meal, and wrapped it in the napkin, which happens to be cloth. So they are, don't really want you running off with those. And was going to feed it to the dog. And the care staff, you know, the gals, they knew the routine, and they're like, "Oh no, no, honey, it's okay. Misty had her food. She had lunch, and it almost got into a. It started to get into an argument." And obviously, the line between being insistent and bordering on potential elder abuse is a very, very thin line. So Absolutely. caregivers, they always err if they're good. They will err on the side of caution and not get into, don't st start a fight with somebody who has no memory. It's not Absolutely. a good idea. Absolutely. So the dog won all the time. But I noticed before we rehomed her, that because she did not have structure and discipline, she was getting a little nutty. Absolutely. Dogs really require that. That is a, that is a significant problem with Alzheimer's and some of the elderly. You know, I don't know what we're going to do with my grandfather's dog when he, you know, he's in the late stage diabetic, you know, problems. You know, rehoming these dogs is a really big problem. And I think, you know, it's not realistic for like you to take a an additional dog sometimes into your home, right? Well, no, and, and my dogs don't like her. Yeah, absolutely. I don't understand this. I, I mean, I, I, I don't have. I understand being very loyal to your dogs, but I also don't. Under, I also have a really hard time with people who are like, "Why well, be insistent on taking the dog into my house?" Well, that's not always a great idea. I mean, it'd be like sometimes it's bringing constant conflict and strife into your house. Your dogs aren't going to like it. That dogs are not going to like it. You're not going to like it. Why not find a good another good home for yeah, that dog? It's not good for anybody. It's not good for anybody. And I know there's people out there who are very insistent and very loyal. And I'm a very loyal person, but at the same time, you kind of, you know, in these situations, find the best home for the dog that you can. You don't have to suffer through those problems. <laughs> you don't. You don't have to feel guilty about finding a good home for the dog. You don't. I don't I don't I just don't buy into that mentality. I don't know why. I don't know I think, why we have to have that mentality sometimes. Well, so. it's nice that we do, but sometimes you have to be realistic. And yes. I knew, I mean, my parents hadn't gone out of town in a long time because it was just too traumatic for my mom. Much, you know, change. It's like you change the dog's routine. Don't change the routine of somebody who's got memory issues because yeah. they just get all confused and, and then they start to get a little hostile or it's just, it's, stressful and it's not fun yes and it's the same with the dogs well my dad got the dog from a breeder so i called the breeder and said you need to take her back yes a good breeder will always do that yeah i had to get a little insistent because she was a little flaky on it and i knew we had a deadline it's like when they come to put the new carpet in dog's got to be gone yeah so i had to get a little bit sna snarky because i basically said either you come get the dog or let me know where to drop her off or I'm taking her to the pound, which was not, I was not going to do that. I'd already contacted poodle rescue yes. and she was 10. So, and she's, you know, she's never had a lot of structure and discipline yeah. and she was super overweight and just finding her a home would have been challenging. I do believe that she went to the breeders grandkids farm in Oregon. So yes. I hope she's living out the remainder of her senior years much happier and healthier. Well, a responsible no, breeder would do that without any questions. I would do that in a second. Um, it wouldn't even be a question for me. We'd find a place and make it work. And yeah. commonly we do rehome play, you know, rehome dogs, but that's just the, the nature of the beast. So. And it's also something that people need to consider. Like, okay, should we, my dad got her in 2009. And well, I guess the beginning of 2010, she was born in 2009, I think. 2008. I got my dog in 2000. He's 11. So she must have been born in 2009. And I said, you know, I just got done. I just got out of the puppy stage with mine. 
the one that's the <laughs> oldest of the three now. I'm like, it's exhausting and I don't have exhausting. diabetes and I'm however many, 25 years younger than my dad was. And I just said, I don't really think it's a good idea. Why don't we go to Poodle Rescue? And he's like, ah, rah, rah, rah. you know, it's all the way down Visalia. I'm like, that's like three hour drive, four hour drive. You have a hybrid. Let's go. I'll go with you. I'll yes. drive your car. It's not a big deal. We'll go. We'll make, it'll be fun. Let's go, dad. Absolutely not. And then I fainted because anybody that's bought a purebred dog knows they are not cheap. Much nope. cheaper than what you were talking about a few minutes ago. But like just going by size, I got a way better deal on my dog. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. And, you know, she never, he, he trained her pretty good, but, you know, she had a doggy door, so they didn't have to worry about that. But I never did understand why he couldn't get my mom not to feed her multiple times a day. It's like, all you have to do is say, oh, it's okay. You just fed her and then just move the food. Just Absolutely. like gr yeah. take it gently. But I guess living with somebody 24 seven that you have to constantly change yeah. their, what they're doing so that you don't overfeed the dog or whatever. You know, these are, I, I did an episode on pets for, with seniors because it's something that, that needs to be considered. Like you said, your grandfather probably shouldn't have gotten a puppy. Yes. You know, and there's lots of older dogs that need rescuing. We, I, we ours was seven months old when we rescued him. So he wasn't, he didn't fit into that there's category. Tons of, there's tons of older dogs that are great companions. We have friends who just rescued a five-year-old dog and they, you know, it's a great opportunity for both. There's plenty of good homes, plenty of good opportunities for dogs too. So. Well, this conversation has made me really want to get a caregiving canine and have it at mom's home, like be in charge of that, which is probably insane. I have enough things to be in charge of, but I just, I'm fascinated by what they can, they can do. Well, I think the important part for us is just to raise awareness that this is something that it's another avenue for our dogs to impact our lives in a very positive way. And hopefully we can start to raise awareness that this is something that they can improve our lives and we can improve the lives of the dogs as well. Cause dogs like to have jobs as well as we do. You know, they want to like, there's dogs out there that want to engage with us and want to do these things. And so it is meaningful for them and it's meaningful for us. And I, I really appreciate you shedding some insight into, you know, this opportunity for us to raise awareness. It, it certainly has been, um, I, I have never had to, care give for an old you know an alzheimer's a dementia patient or family member and so for me it's been insightful to, to uh, just discuss some of those topics i can see totally how how they impact you personally so yeah just just the repetitive behaviors you know not remembering that she fed the dog the dog was also smart because she would look at the top of the refrigerator which is much harder when you're a miniature poodle. And she would look at the top of the refrigerator where the treats were. My mom would be like, oh, the dog needs a treat. Or the dog would want to interact with my mom, play a little bit. And my mom would automatically feed her. That was the go-to interaction. And I'm not really sure how you would train a dog to not take treats, because I don't know about you, but golden retrievers are mine. I think sometimes my girl dog only loves me because I'm the food dispenser. Yep. Hard, hard to know. I hope she loves me for more than that. Um, and I did read in the article that they can also bring somebody meds in a bite proof package, which is interesting. Absolutely. Yes. Um, you know, you can train your dog not to be, to be, you can train your dog not to eat certain things. It's not, I mean, we do it all the time in German Shepherds and um, Siggy, if I, if I wanted Siggy to leave something, I can just tell her to leave it. And it's just, a, it's just a matter of training, right? You can, you can train okay. a dog to do anything you want. That is so true. I, I think my older, the previous ones were trained a little better when I was younger and had more stamina. Absolutely. You know, I started to we get away with that. burger. <laughs> yes. We've all been there. We've yeah. all been there. <laughs> um, yeah. But I, I see because so many families are not blessed with, you know, my dad, my parents home was paid for. And in California, we had a proposition back in the late seventies that capped property taxes and it's complicated and I have a hard time explaining it, but essentially my parents' property taxes for the year are what mine are for the month. 
Oh, wow. Their property taxes are cheap. Oh, that's so, great. Yeah, for her. <laughs> <laughs> so we've rented out her home and her social security, plus my dad's investments. She should have enough money to stay in her residence until the end, which is good because I don't, I don't, I don't now she needs help showering. I don't, I don't want her. <laughs> it's like, I'll visit regularly. I don't, I don't want to get hard. into it. It's That's hard. It is. And it's a lot of people in the beginning stages, families, you know, like children, my, you know, my age children, they're like, but it's my mom. You know, she was there when I, when I, you know, she diapered me, you know, she was there when I was sick, but caregiving and raising children are not the same. No. I, I'm pretty passionate about passing that message on a lot because when you have a kid, you know, like I said with mine, you get through the terrible twos and then you're on to the clingy fours and you get through these stages and you know there's an, kind of an end date. They're going to graduate from high school. They're going to hit 18. If it's, you know, your prerogative, they could be gone at 18. You're done. Yeah. Okay. My mom has had Alzheimer's for close to 20 years and she's 76. So she could live easily another 15 years. That's 35 years. That's my entire adult life. I was like, no, thank you. Yeah, and you're looking at a decline. You're exactly. not looking at, at, there's no upside really. Well, I mean, you can't, there's... you can't just call up the teen, the neighborhood teenager for at, to babysit. Yeah. Um, you can't, like I've talked to people who care for their loved ones in their home and because of the memory loss, they're not, you know, it's like, I need this now. You know, oh, I'm done with my lunch. Come get my plate. I, I need to go to the bathroom now. I need that. You know, there's no patience. So if you're trying to work from home, like I do, and they need assistance, it's an immediate drop what you're doing and go take care of them. And that just gets more and more and more. So I can see how a dog could help if they had, if they helped interrupt the repetitive behaviors, if you could in the earlier stages send them out for a walk and not be in a heightened state of panic until they got back. That would be great. I can just see, I'm just like, I can't believe I've, I've had dogs my whole life. I've been in this Alzheimer's journey forever. I can't believe I've never heard of a caregiving canine. <laughs> well, there's yep. so much that dogs can do for patients with dementia and Alzheimer's. And we'll post some of the great articles about this in, in our show notes. But like you said, you know, delivering medicines, reminding them to eat and, and yes, I believe you definitely can train a dog to not eat more than they're supposed to. I think, I'm, I wouldn't think that a, an Alzheimer's and a dementia dog would, I mean, I, mean I, I wouldn't think you'd have a dog like that, that. I would, I would, I would think, <laughs> I would think that if they came trained with tasks, like, sure, this is what well, I'm supposed yeah. to do. You know, like I said, Misty was starting to get a little bit crazy. Like my, I try to take my mom out of the residence partly because there are days when I just can't deal with her and the other people. It's hard enough dealing with her and her other, her other friend. My mom has only befriended people named Diane, which is her name. It's super <laughs> confusing. <laughs> so this new Diane closer to sundowner time starts getting very, um, lonely for her husband who i'm assuming is gone or she probably wouldn't be there and she gets like we went out last week to the fabric store and she started getting panicky that she was going to miss him and it's like i'm not leaving here until i finish this errand and it took way too long to get the fabric cut if i take them to the fabric store again i'm getting the number for cutting fabric way before we decide what we're <laughs> getting because that was the hold up and it was it was not relaxing at all because she kind of wound up my mom about, you know, missing dinner and missing where, you know, well, my husband's going to show up and then she goes off on this weird tangent. So I try to take my mom out and I lost my train of thought because I was telling the story. I hate it when I do that. <laughs> I do that all the time. Michelle has to kind of reel me in. So. Well, fortunately, just to, just to calm any concerns, that is not a sign of Alzheimer's. <laughs> Memory loss that affects daily life is a sign that you got to pay, pay attention to, but rambling on and on and then forgetting your point is normal. <laughs> I think Thank that's you. just getting older. Yes. It's because I was talking I the too same much. Thing. 
<laughs> well, I appreciate your time, Jennifer. We certainly, uh, I'm excited to see if we can expand awareness of this, pro uh, this topic and see if we can get more dogs into these scenarios. And so we're excited that you're sharing the message and we're excited to share your message of helping caregivers with, you know, just receiving daily care. So yeah. we still I appreciate it. Well, I think people taking care of their family members in their home, I think a dog could be a huge help. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. and I think I'm going to talk to the executive director, mom's place and, and tell them, Hey, what are, have you ever heard of this? And feel them out. Cause I really, I really like the idea. I can picture a golden retriever walking around their residence and helping some of the people that just need, like the, there was a gal the other day was looking for Sydney. There was no Sydney and you could not tell her there was no Sydney. And just, it, there's, it's so hard to break that. Well, even if you brought in therapy dogs a couple times a week, those, those, all those kind of things can help. And facilitate. Well, I took my oldest when I visited once, and he seemed very uncomfortable. So I'm going to take well, not all dogs. Not all dogs are designed. To, I mean, it's kind of like if you take you know people, different people in different environments. Sometimes dogs are not really comfortable. There are dogs that are very well trained and adapted for going into new environments and meeting new people, and just they just love it, thrive it, thrive on. Well, it. maybe to enhance the social awareness of this episode, I will take one of the other two, the younger two. Uh -huh. and see how they interact with the residents and get some, you know, whatever, video footage, digital recording. I'm old, so <laughs> it's still video in my world. We've got Pet Partners. Uh, uh, Pet Partners is a therapy dog organization and see if they'll bring one of their, there's people who are trained and they have insurance and they have been certified and they can come in and, and do that for you as well. So there's all kinds of good options that you know maybe if you're yeah, I'll, I'll talk to my neighbor because like i said she does that they don't do that particular residence though so i'll find out if there's a reason for that yeah and i'm just excited that we got to talk about this because like i said i didn't know there was even i didn't know they could do all this just silly <laughs> well that's <laughs> we're glad we could help so. well i will definitely <laughs> spread the word and ben and i'll have to get back and do another episode absolutely you i will take i will talk you know michelle will know this i will talk about biochemistry anytime any place <laughs> well as long as you can as, you know i hate to use the word dumb it down but as long as you can simplify it for those well, of us if you just ask me questions i can try i can do my best so and if not you can just mute me for a certain part <laughs> you can just <laughs> so <laughs> anyway. well, well i will think about a, another topic that we can do and i'll email you perfect so. all righty well you guys have a fantastic evening you thank too. you jennifer same to you thanks so much okay we'll talk to you bye later bye bye bye, -bye. bye.